All right. Good evening, my brothers and my sisters. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Spread the word. We're getting ready for the Bible study tonight. Foundations of an effective Christian is going down tonight. Let's see here. All right. Welcome tonight. Welcome. Welcome. So glad to see you all. Amen. God bless you. God bless you tonight. God bless you. Amen. Hey, how you doing? Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. All right. Get your pen. Get your paper. Taking notes tonight. Steady to show ourselves approved tonight. Amen. Let's just go into prayer tonight. Father God, we thank you tonight for your spirit, Lord. Uh, we don't have words, God, for you know how gracious and how grateful we are uh, of you just loving us. So God, we ask tonight that whatever is taught tonight be done in spirit and in truth, that we be convicted about our conversion. To understand that there are things that we have said and done that have not been acceptable to your sight. God, we ask you to wash us whiter than snow. We come in the spirit of repentance, God, uh, and not a spirit of repeating what we've done wrong, God. We ask right now you would set us to the road call straight. Give us the ability and the strength and the mind and the spirit to follow you. For you are the true author and the finisher of our faith. You are the clay maker. We are the clay. Shape us, make us, and mold us, God, in what you would have us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We all say together, amen. 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 Good evening tonight, my brothers and sisters. So glad to see you. You guys are jumping on strong. Let's look at we're going to have a full load tonight. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's just go into what God would have for us tonight. Uh, get in where you fit in. Uh, ask the good Lord to show you the way. And I know that he's going to be setting up some things for us. So I cannot say enough. Uh, how much I love for you to get in where you can. There are some things about tonight we're going to talk about that I think are really going to encourage uh, those kind of folk who are still trying to say, well, God, what would you have of me to learn? What would you have me to know? And I believe that God is going to give you the road call straight. Uh, tonight we're on the seven foundations of an effective Christian. Seven foundations of an effective Christian. And when we talk about that, We've had the opportunity to deal with uh, three other parts of this. And um, part one, we were dealing with identification, identification. And basically what that was is trying to make sure I understand uh, who I am. What am I identified as? How do I identify myself in my daily walk? How do I identify myself in the things that I do? How do I identify myself in the walk that I am from day to day? You know, when I'm at work, when I'm at school, when I'm doing the things of life, how do I identify? And I want to encourage you tonight by letting you know that a lot of uh, your identification rubs off on others. They watch, they observe, they 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 look, and and so some even copy uh, what they believe they are seeing of you that shows that brightness of God in you. So you have to make sure that you understand who you are. So when they come to you and begin to ask you questions about yourself, you can easily speak about the God that dwells within you. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to know who you are in God. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. So let's look a little further. Uh, our second part, we dealt with clarification. And in that part, we are beginning to not just know who we are, but know our purpose, our, our belonging, why we do what we do, why we say what we say, why we believe what we believe. Uh, why do we uh, speak the way we speak about things in life? Because, you know, you... People, you know, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. But let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, people follow people. There ain't no way around it, no way that you can confuse it. Folk follow folk. So you want to make sure that the God in you is what they're following, not just you, the God in you. And through God following the God in you, they begin to understand their true purpose and understand that God has some great things in store for them. Amen? 
amen tonight. Good to see you guys. God bless you. So let's look a little further. We got to our third part. And our third part was last week dealing with motivation. Motivation. What pushes you to be who you are in God? What causes you to look a little further within yourself? What compels you to say that, you know what, I'm not just identified as a Christian. I'm not just clarifying what my role is, but I'm now putting it to a place where it compels me, it motivates me, it inspires me. Because in order to have that true passion, there ought to be some compassion. Amen? Because when you have a passion about what you do, passion about how you love and deal with people, the more you want to, uh, Brother David Hill, you want to see how you can put that in the practice of getting others to feel just as good about themselves as well. does no good for me to feel good about myself and everybody around me doesn't feel good about themselves. That's a heavy weight to carry. So I want to ask myself, if I'm feeling good about myself, what can I do from what I've learned to help somebody be motivated to know that they are encouraged? Amen? So we looked at that. And we talked about that, and I really thought that was a really good subject. It began to bring things home, motivated to what we do, motivated to what we believe, and motivated to what we understand. And when we begin to understand what motivates us, then we can understand what doesn't motivate us. And so we have to ask ourselves, what keeps me from being closer to God? Something's not motivating me. Something's not causing me to have that oomph, that, that can I get out there? Can I get in there? Can I get involved? And so find out what that is. And when you find out what that is, that's what you work on. A lot of times we don't want to work on our weaknesses. We want to live off of our strengths. But I'm encouraging you as a real Christian in God, take those weaknesses because they will soon become your strength if you push your heart into it. Amen? Amen. So let's look tonight. Now tonight we're going to be talking about part four, seven foundations of an effective Christian. I wish somebody would put that out for me. If you don't mind, uh, Lady Oz, if you help your brother out tonight, uh, seven foundations of an effective Christian. Tonight, we're going into part four. And part four, uh, Sister Legetta, love you so much, uh, is collaboration. 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 That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Collaborating. Uh, and we're talking about as a group of one which is sometimes not as easy as we would like it to sound, as we would like it to be. Uh, Sister Legella, you're going to get into this because you know what I'm talking about, coming together as a group to perform a certain mission or a calling. Uh, you should never have to be involved in the journey of life alone. Okay? And, you should, and so the same should be about the work of God as well. We should not be in this alone. The Bible tells us clearly we should not be an island upon ourselves. We should be able to do out. When the book of Genesis, it talked about even when Adam was on the earth and he had named all the animals and done all the things that, that, that you know a man would do to be encouraged, God said it's not good. It's not good for him to be alone. He needs somebody that can also help him do what? What we're talking about these last four weeks. He needs somebody that can help him identify. He needs somebody that can help him clarify. He needs somebody that can help him motivate. And now tonight, he needs somebody to help collaborate with him to give him that extra oomph about being who you are on this earth. So let's look. He says you should do so in the context of a team effort for the plan of longevity. Now, you do a lot of things on your own, but over a longevity of time, it is best to be able to do things in a team effort. Why? That way it's not everything pulled on you. You're not always the person overwhelmed. You're not the person that's always being drawn to for answers. You're not the person that's always putting themselves in, 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 in a position where it looks like you're doing all of the work, all of the time. That's overwhelming for any Christian, let alone anyone in, in just general watching, not even being saved. Just general work on your job, you shouldn't be doing it alone. You should find that quality time of utilizing the benefits of the goals and talents of others to get that goal accomplished. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's talk about this. He says, if God brings you into the work of ministry, he's going to bring other people with similar faith with you. I said similar faith. And it's the same faith. There's a difference. But he will send you, uh, Brother Stanley, people of a similar faith, Sister Rose. He's going to let you know that people of a similar faith will be around you. And when you begin to find out how that is, then you begin to understand that those people of similar faith have a desire to help you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we also got to understand because they don't have the same faith you have, there are limitations and boundaries to what they can and will do with you over the long haul. And so that's why the Bible tells you to what? Know those that labor among you. All right? And that's the good things about a good leader. 
is that he begins to know, she begins to know the talents and gifts of the people so they know where their shortcomings are so that they don't put them in a position to fail and then be upset because they failed. All right? If you know what a person's strengths are, you try to help them in them streets, even though you know they have certain weaknesses about things, on the back end, you try to help them increase those weaknesses as well, but what you don't do is put them in a position of failure. That's not good leadership. Amen? So we're talking about being an effective Christian. So let's look tonight. We're going to go to the book of Proverbs, and I love the book of Proverbs, and I want to encourage any um, uh, newfound Christian or even a senior Christian that, you know what, I love the Bible, but I'm not as good with reading it uh, the way I would like. I always encourage people, look into the book of Psalms and look into the book of Proverbs, and you will get a much clearer answer about things because it is a lot simpler to understand whether you read a King James or an NIV or an ESV of what God is asking of you as a person, asking of you as a family, asking you as a Christian. So I want you to do that tonight. So we're looking at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. I want somebody to find that for me, please. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. We're talking about collaboration tonight. Somebody will post that for me, please. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Amen. Amen. We're talking about collaboration. And so the Bible tells us quickly, he said, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Amen? Iron sharpens iron. So in this particular text, uh, you can see the Lord is using um, the element of metal. All right? He's using the element of metal. And one thing that we know about metal is, metal is weather resistant. Right? It can handle the rain, it can handle the sun, it can handle the cold, it can handle the heat. Uh, so when God uses this version of iron, that lets you know that it can handle pretty much any environment that it's in. Amen? So Sister Andrew, when we're hearing this tonight, you have to ask yourself, am I iron made by God, bro Arthur, that I can withstand whatever environment that I'm in? Can I can I can I work in an environment where everything's going my way? And can I work in an environment where everything's not going my way? Can I work in an environment where I don't know which way it's going? That's the that's the beauty of iron. That's the beauty of that element. That particular element can work in any environment, bro Edgar, that it's in. And so as Christians, we have to find ourselves being able to work in any in, in any element. Of, of, of or condition that we're in, whether we're feeling very, very good, whether we're not feeling so good, whether our health is 100% or whether we're not feeling a little bit under the weather. What can I still do in the body of Christ to be relevant? Hmm? Is my spirit a spirit of iron, a spirit of being able to work in any environment that it's in? No matter what's going on, whether it's too hot, whether it's too cold, whether it's working for me, not working for me, whether it's what I want to hear, whether it's not what I want to hear, because if I'm in the spirit of that iron, I can handle that element. I stopped to encourage somebody tonight that you are a true, that's why he said you were, you were beautifully and wonderfully made. You were made with the spirit of iron that you can handle anything that comes against you. Yes, the doctor said one thing, but you know what? God's still going to do something else, bro, Tyrone. Yes, something may happen to you at the courthouse, but God still got you free to do what you need to do. Yes, something may happen within your relationship or in your marriage, but you just keep praying and keep trusting that God is going to do something great for you, and you will see that iron withstands anything the enemy tries to put against it. it, it you know, that's what I love about a good piece of iron. You can hit up on it, you can beat up on it, you can stretch up on it, but it still withstands the test of time. That's what I'm telling somebody tonight. That's who you are. Brothers and sisters, that's who you are. You are that spirit of iron. But let's look at it all together here. He says iron sharpens iron. He didn't say iron sharpens wood. Hmm. He didn't say iron sharpens rocks. He didn't say iron sharpens 
hey, plastic. He said, iron sharpens iron. What am I saying tonight? Who are you collaborating with? Who are you coming together with? He says, iron sharpens iron. I'm slowing down because I want this to sink in for a little bit. He says, iron sharpens iron. Not any other element. Not any other material. Iron sharpens iron. So what he's saying is, we, we both have to be in a certain place together that causes for me to feed off of you and you to feed off of me. But let's be conscious about this. A lot of us, our inner circle, we're, we're having the spirit of iron, but the people we're around don't. And we can't seem to figure out why we can't progress. Because what you have is you have people who are feeding off of you. They're draining your spirit. They're draining your desires. They're draining your joy. They're draining your patience. And so before you know it, you find yourself overwhelmed, Brother Demetrius, Sister Angie, that you can't move forward in life. And here's the dilemma. When you don't, when that iron does not get sharpened by another piece of iron, you still got to use it. So what I'm saying is when you don't get your knowledge sharpened, then you're going to the, you're going to the battle with a dull blade. Y'all not hearing me? When you get ready, if you're not getting that iron sharpened the way it needs to be ironed, to do what it needs to do, to encourage what it needs to encourage, Deacon Crokey, I know you're hearing me tonight, then you're finding yourself in the battle not prepared and not ready for what's going to be happening. You taking a butter knife? The war? No, sir. No, ma'am. You want a you want a sharp blade, and as the Bible said, you want a double-edged sword, so it can do what it needs to do on both sides of what's happening. When you swing left and when you swing right, you want the same effect. Whatever is the enemy is trying to put on you, you want to be able to cut it away. Pastor Andre, we're just trying to help folk tonight. We're talking about uh, uh, foundations of an effective Christian. Collaboration. Collaboration. Amen? Iron sharpens iron. Brothers and sisters, I'm not telling you that you have to uh, walk around like you're holier than thou and don't speak to anybody. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, you got to quit going to weak people about strong things. I've said it. I'm going to say it again. You can't keep going to dull people about a sharp situation. They can't help you. And as I, say, as I say almost every day of my life, people can't give you what they don't have. If they are not a person of self-respect, they cannot give you respect. If they're not a person of self-love, then they cannot love you. If they're not a person of self-joy, then they cannot bring joy when they're in the room. I was watching the other day. There was a commercial, a Zillow commercial. And the lady uh, comes into this room and she's got like 50 different versions of herself. And so she says, you get ready to buy a house. And so she asks, she says, okay, let's see. We want to buy a house. Negative me. And negative me said, don't try it. It ain't going to work. She says, okay, confuse me. Confuse me says, I don't know. You know, I don't know. She says, positive me. She says, positive me said, we got this thing. Let's do it. And then they go, me, me, me. Me, me, me. She gets all of the me's, no matter what situation they're in, all of them come together. What am I saying tonight? You have the ability that even if you're in a room full of people who are negative, even if you're in a room full of who are confused, you still have the ability and the power to transform the whole room into the same mindset of positivity because you are that sharp iron. But it's got to work both ways, guys. You can't be always the one pushing. Somebody else got to push too. 
You can't always be the one pulling. Somebody else got to pull too. Madonna, you hear me tonight. We got to find a way to work and collaborate together as one. Because I tell people, if you are not relevant, you are irrelevant. Ask yourself, are you relevant in your marriage? Are you relevant on your job? I know you get paid there. I know that your name is on your desk. But are you relevant? Are you relevant in your church? Yes, you've been going there for 10, 12, 14, 16 years. That's not what I'm questioning. I'm asking, Brother Lennox, tonight, are you relevant? Because when you're relevant, you're real. And when you're real, you respond. And when you respond, things get done. See, people who have a sense of response and a sense of responsibility, make sure that they're in availability. Ask yourself, are you available? How can you collaborate and you're not available? How do you say you're responsible, reliable, and accountable when you're not available? And sometimes you could be in the room and still not be there. There's an old secular song, because, you know, Pastor always, you know, do what he's doing now. He said, hanging out a few juke joints, a hole in the wall. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He said, the song would say, my body's here with you, but my mind is on the other side of town. And some of us are coming and we're sitting right there on our jobs. Our body is there, but our mind is on the other side of town. Some of us are coming, we're sitting in our living rooms or in our bedrooms or in our dining rooms, and our body is there, but our mind is on the other side of town. Some of us are coming to the house of God and we're actually doing duties. We're actually having uh, our gifts and talents being used, and our mind is on the other side of town. The iron's being missed. Nothing's getting sharpened. All that's happening is a dull effect. Let's look a little closer. So we're talking about tonight. Collaboration. So our first point about collaboration is we must be generous. We must be generous. Now, let me help you with generous. Generous means that we are open. It don't mean that we fools. <laughs> That's okay, somebody say amen. Generous means we must be open, but it does not mean we must be fools. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? Well, the Bible clearly tells us to cast not our pearls to swine, right? Know those that labor among you, right? A wicked tree can only bear wicked fruit. A righteous tree can only bear righteous fruit. Why does God tell us all of that stuff? Because he wants to make sure we know what we're dealing with. We know what we're, what we're, ooh, I just heard the Holy Ghost. He said, iron sharpens irons. We got to know what we're rubbing up against. We can be generous. We can be open, but we can't be fools. I preached a sermon one time. I'll bring it back around again. Putting your love where it don't belong. Mm. Because your love is precious. Your love has value. Let me help somebody tonight. I hear the Holy Ghost speaking again. Some of us have taken the opportunity to believe that we don't really matter. So because we don't really matter, we give our love to anything or anybody. And then we're upset because we're treated a certain way after we give it. And so I come to encourage you tonight that you not be generous with your love in a foolish mindset. God has given you great gifts and talents of knowing who you are in God. And so you make sure that you don't take the opportunity to give away what God has given you to somebody who's not going to rightly appreciate it and give the value that it truly is deserving of. So many times, guys, we try to impress people by what we know and where we've been and what we've got going. But I want to encourage you tonight, Sister Dahlia, that you got to start asking yourself, if I know God has given me this gift and I know he's given me this talent, it's for me to be able to help somebody who wants help. Yeah. Let me help you. Jesus walked by and helped a lot of people. However, he also walked by a lot of people and didn't say nothing. I know that hurts, don't it? 
But that's truth. If Lazarus hadn't gotten in the tree, he'd have kept on going. He had to put himself in position to receive what God had for him. So I'm asking you tonight, are you collaborating in the right position for God to use you? Golly, I hear Holy Ghost talking. And for some of us, just because you got a really good gift in something don't mean God don't want to use you in some other area. And then you get upset because God don't use you in the area that you want to be used in because that's where you, you know, you get your best accolade. That's where you get your best pats on the back. But the, God, but the good thing about it is God said, thy well done, thy good and faithful what? Servant. He didn't say good and faithful pastor, good and faithful elder, evangelist, minister, bishop, apostle, overseer, whatever you might call yourself. He didn't say that. He said good and faithful servant. If you can't serve, you can't say. Do you have the spirit of service tonight? Because that's what collaboration is. It's the spirit of service. And that's so tonight he's saying we must be generous. We must be generous servants. You know, you go and ask any waiter or waitress or what they're called now in, in the professional realm in the restaurants. Why is it they say the worst people that they have to deal with is church people? Why is that? Why is that? They would rather deal with a football team of youth at 12 years old than a table of five coming home coming from church in full dress attire. They'd rather deal with 50 kids. Why is that? Brothers and sisters, in order to be great, we must be grateful. I repeat, in order to be great, we must be grateful. Are you grateful tonight? Because if you're grateful tonight, you should be generous. Open, but not foolish. Open, but not foolish. Let's look at the next text. We're drawing it tonight, right? <laughs> uh, amen. Hold on. Let's see here. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Somebody find that for me. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Post that for me too. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Good to see you tonight, bro bear. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. We're praying for your son as well. May he continue to prosper. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Post that for me, Sister Angie, Sister Rose. Proverbs chapter 11. Verse 14. Amen. He says, when there is no guidance, people fall. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. So let's look back at the first scripture. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. When there is no guidance, a, a people fall. So what is that saying? If you sharpen your sword, you still need people around you to teach you how to swing it. <laughs> Amen? One of my good buddies, uh, Brother Wagner's on tonight, pro football player. Putting on the cleats is good, but you still got to be taught how to run the routes. Right, Robert? You still got to have that group of counselors, that group of coaches, that group of people who, who give you the encouragement of seeing not just your favorites, but they also see your faults. But they take your faults and help you to increase it into your favor. Hence the problem. 
Real love, brothers and sisters, real love is correction, direction, protection. We don't like to be corrected. We don't like anybody telling us where to go. And we can take care of ourselves. That's not collaboration. That's you living on an island. As Frank Sinatra said, you did it your way. But the spirit of what we're supposed to be doing is God's way. He said, when there is no guidance. So let's look at this. Take, let's take a two-year-old child who's holding a steak knife. The iron has sharpened the iron. Is that not still a dangerous situation? Because what has occurred? The child is not in the room of guidance. We got to find a way for that to happen. That we look into further in ourselves and say, am I the kind of person that I can see that someone needs help? That I can pour into them what God says. But the best way I'm going to start doing that is not by what I'm saying, Sister Zoe. It's going to be by how I'm living. As my, my favorite deacon tells me, deacon said, he said, I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Are you a walking sermon? And that doesn't mean you don't have issues. Let me help somebody. It doesn't mean that God is still working on you with nothing. It doesn't mean that you don't come short in things. But what it does mean that even in your wrong, even in you say wrong, do wrong, you're convicted. And I tell people, find me a man with no conviction, and I'm telling you, he not converted. It ain't possible. It is not possible to be comfortable in your mess on a daily basis and tell people you saved. It ain't possible. That's a lie going on somewhere. And the book tells us quickly, let God be true and what? Not some, not most, but every man be a liar. So when you begin to learn how to speak in the spirit of God, then you are also able to look and say, you know what? I got some things wrong with me. I got some things God need to work on me about. There's some things that I've really got to keep working on and plugging on and moving on and getting on to get better in, to get stronger in, to get wiser in. Not just because it's for me so that I can help other people get stronger and wiser and better. Well, what's wrong with them? And before you know it, iron is sharpening iron. We're collaborating together and before you know it we're generous he says in the abundance of counselors what does your inner circle look like now I'm going to say something go upset some people every leader ought to have a leader every pastor ought to have a pastor mm -hmm. if you run around here talking about I got an overseer uh, over in Africa no offense. He can't get his hands and his eyes on you. She can't get it. I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm upsetting some folk. But let's be real about it. You need somebody who can be that confidant for you. That you can say whatever you need to say. However you need to say it. And they're going to come back and give you the reality of not just what favors you, but also where your faults are. And once you begin to see that, then you can see where your focus is. Because sometimes we spend too much time focusing on our faults than on our favor. And sometimes we spend too much time focusing on our favor than on our faults. Because in our faults, we know where to put them. And he said, cast your burdens unto him. But if I don't know how to cast my burdens unto him, because I'm too busy over here being exalted about what I can sing, teach, preach, say, I'm not dealing with the obvious. And as a Jerry tonight, that's what we want to deal with. We're trying to do about collaboration is dealing with the obvious. And sometimes even the obvious can be hidden. Be in the abundance. <coughs> Are you in the abundance tonight? You ain't got to always be in spiritual poverty. Let me help explain that. <clears throat> God has a unique ability to give you the opportunity for your desires to match his decisions. 
However, we also have to understand another familiar text that our ways are not his ways and our his thoughts are not our thoughts. So when you ask God for something, you have to be prepared for whatever he brings to you in the way he brings it. You can't ask God for a man or a husband, ask him to keep working on him and not let him work on you. And vice versa. You have to find that abundance of counselors because he says in the abundance of counselors, there is what? Safety. That means there is a covering. And when God covers you, that means that he takes away the obvious. Y'all not, not getting this. The obvious is there, but he is hidden it. He says that God can close a door no man can open and open a door no man can close. He, he you know, uh, I'm, I got it twisted, but you get where I'm going with this. That no man can close a door that he opens and no man can uh, open a door that he closes. What I'm saying is God has a unique ability to still take the obvious, hide it. So you still can so let your light shine before men that they might see your good works, even when you got bad stuff going on. But I want to caution you that you're covered on the grace with that. And grace is nothing more than an opportunity for what has been hidden to be gotten rid of. God does not cover what's wrong with you for you to still walk around and do wrong and say you're living right. I probably lost about 12 of y'all down that one, didn't I? But that's the truth. God did not give us this unique ability to be able to project the goodness of who he is and then do what we want to do in the background. So let's look a little further. When there is no guidance, let me help some brothers and sisters tonight. I know the pandemic has, has, has hurt a lot of folk. A lot of churches are closed down. A lot of people have not been made available uh, to go back to their places of worship. Where are you going? Who are you connected with? Because in collaboration, you can't say I'm doing God work out there on your own. That's why he put 12 people together. Jesus didn't, did he have to have 12 disciples to do the work he needed to do? He was performing miracles all by himself. Whether they were standing there or not standing there. But he wanted to show you the example of why we must come together and assemble ourselves. Where's the church home? Y'all weren't ready for that one. How you get a pastor to marry you and then don't go to no church nowhere? What was the pastor for? He good enough to marry you, but not good enough to pastor you? He not good enough to collaborate with you in your marriage with God and your spouse? That together, God is going to use you mightily for future couples to come? You ain't just get married for you and your spouse. You got married to show others that the beauty of getting married. Sister Deborah, I'm trying to help him. That's not why God allows us to have the benefits of what he says in the Bible. It is for us to set uh, physical examples of a supernatural thing happening between two people who probably would not even got together if it hadn't been for God. God put you together. That's why he said that he, that no man could put asunder, including the two people to get married, unless you marry unequally yoked. What do I mean? Your iron ain't sharper than iron and y'all just hooked up. He iron, you wood. You wood, he iron. Don't be mad. Don't blame nobody. Don't say it was this. Don't say it was that. 
But I want to encourage you likewise. If God puts you together, you better fight for it. You better say, look, bro, I know you got some problems. I got some problems. But I'm telling you right now, we're going to the floor on this one. If you're going to be the head of the household, then the first thing you're going to do is teach your family how to get on their knees. And when we get on our knees, we're going to pray that God remove what don't belong in our marriage, belong in our house, belong in our children, and don't belong within ourselves so that we can move forward. Because there's some couples down the road that need to know we had some mistakes, but thank God it turned into miracles. That's why we together. We ain't just together just to pay bills till we so old that our kids got to drive us around and take us to, to, the, to the doctor every other Friday. I hope I'm helping somebody. We are together this week and show the unity of God bringing two people who got a yin and a yang and putting them together and making them one in spirit. And they begin to build each other up to a point that they love. It covers a multitude of what's y'all not getting this. It covers a multitude of what's going on. And when you begin to believe in yourself that what God has given you, you don't let no man, you don't let no person, no place and no thing get in the middle of it. Because it's not about situations, brothers and sisters. It's about salvation. I'm sorry, I raised my voice tonight. Let's look at the last scripture tonight. We're talking about, brothers and sisters, somebody post this, seven foundations of an effective Christian. Seven foundations of an effective Christian. Tonight we're in part four. And part four is talking about collaboration. If there is no collaboration with God, that's why you struggle collaborating with people. Everywhere you go, you got a problem. Everywhere you go, there's a hang up. Everywhere you go, there's a fallout. Everywhere you go, you the victim. The devil is a liar. The spirit of God doesn't operate like that. Now, will you have challenges wherever you go? Probably. Will you have trials and tribulations wherever you go? Probably. But one thing I've learned over this little short life of living on this earth now that I didn't know back then, but I know right now, is I don't let things move me like it used to move me. I don't let things get over into my mind like it used to get over. I just say it's part of the job. It's part of the gig. I don't take nothing personal how people talk to me. I don't take how personal what people say about me. They're supposed to do just what they're supposed to do. And when you begin to realize people are just being who they are, then you can be who you're supposed to be. So who are you tonight? You know what they are. Who are you? You know what they're doing. What are you doing? You know where they're going. Where are you going? You know what they believe. What do you believe tonight? My God, I hope I'm helping somebody. So the last scripture tonight, we're going to go to... Psalms 133, Psalms 133. We're talking about collaboration tonight. Collaboration. My first point is, in order for us to be collab and full of collaboration, we must be generous. We must be generous. Now it talks about... <clears throat> Second part is we must be givers. We must be givers. If you're going to be a counselor, you got to be a giver. Now I say this all the time. If you ain't giving, you taking. I repeat, if you're not giving, you taking. How do you know you're a giver? It's hard for you to take. <laughs> we battle with it, don't we? Bro, Eddie, we, 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 we battle with giving. <laughs> I mean, taking. We'll give all day long. And turn down 10 things come our way. But I'm trying to encourage somebody tonight. You cannot be an oxymoron. Okay? If you are a giver, you still have to be able to receive. Because when you're able to receive, then you allow people the power of giving. So when I deny somebody the ability to give, then I really have put them in a bad position. Y'all not hearing me? I cannot project to them to be givers and then deny them the opportunity to give because my pride won't let me take what they're giving You can't do both. Now, with that being said, 
Let God be the guide in your giving. How is it you can give to that cousin for the 14th time to bail him out of something and you know it ain't going up, it ain't prospering, it ain't sharpening no iron. Come to your house of God and chuck pennies in the bucket. But you say this is the best church this side of heaven for you. If it wasn't for your church family, you'll know where you would be. Oh, you just thank God for your pastor and your first lady. You just thank God for all your, your leaders. You thank God for all your sisters and brothers in the ministry. You thank God for all of that. And you come here, and as soon as something needs to be done, your face roll up. But you go let that cousin of yours, that niece, that auntie, that sister, that brother, Use you all day long, and you know what they're going to go do with it. And you don't bat an eye. Then you come stressed, all burnt out, hair losing, you, you can't stop crying, and you sit up there in the front pew going, I don't know why I feel this way. Because you've been given what God has given you to the wrong place. And I'm not saying running down, and, and I'm not, let me help somebody here, because I, I know what people say. See, when I was in the street, Pastor uh, Joseph, nobody told me about I was doing too much. When I was running and doing whatever I wanted to do, when I was in the military, it was all over the place. When I went there with junk, junk, hole in the wall. When I was staying out all night and getting up, getting off at 5 o'clock out the club, get, eating breakfast and going to work at 8 o'clock. Nobody said, Stanley, you need to slow down. You need to get some rest. But as soon as I got in the house of God, oh, my God, them people got you down there wide open. They got you taking all your stuff. They taking all your money. They taking all your time. Well, when I was running the street, terrorizing my life, nobody told me to slow down. Nobody called me and said, hey, man, the Lord told me to tell you. You need to, you need to, they didn't tell me that. See, that's the trick of the enemy. Because as soon as you're trying to do what God have you to do, collaborate with those who are going to have similar faith, similar mindset, similar joy, similar setups to help you stay in the walk of Christ. Now, all of a sudden, they bring that up. You down there again, they, child, all they want is your money. Well, guess what? All Walmart want is your money. They don't really care if you come in there or not. You can buy online. <laughs> Let's look how God is telling us. Psalms 133. He said, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Dwell together. In unity. Now he's telling us, take notice. Behold, take notice. How good. Well, how, how important is the word good? The Lord said he made the world and it was good. That means his hands was upon it. And now he's saying, I want to collaborate with you to do my good. And that's why I want to encourage somebody tonight. Maybe you're saying tonight, you know, I got too much on a dumb pastor, too much I got going on in my life. God didn't want to use you. The devil is a liar. God wants to use you. And I want to encourage you tonight. All you got to do is start confessing and believing in the Lord Jesus that he died for your sins. The Bible says you shall be saved. Now, you can be saved, but you still got to work on being delivered. Somebody know what deliverance is, right? And then when you get work on being delivered, then you can be set free. And when you set free, my God, what a feeling it is. Somebody say amen on being free. When you are free, then you don't have to sit here and battle in your mind about getting up in the morning, about working through your day, about laying down at night. You're not concerned about whether somebody care about what you did or didn't do. You're not worried about what somebody said or didn't say. You're not worried about what people believe or don't believe. All you're concerned about is, did I please God? Yeah. Did I please God? And by pleasing God, he brings people around me that encourage me in my walk and say to me, hey, bro, you're doing good. Keep on pushing. Sis, you're doing fine. Keep on pushing. Don't worry about what they're saying. Don't worry about what they're doing. Keep on loving your family. Keep on loving the people who despitefully use you. Keep on doing what they say. Don't worry about that. God got his hand on you. He said, how good and pleasant. And that's what I need you to start doing. Start taking some pleasantry in your misery. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
Start taking some pleasantry in your misery. Because I'm telling you, God is going to take you to a new level and a whole new level. If you can't go through nothing, you can't help nobody. Because a person that can't go through nothing can't be trusted. And if God can't trust you, he can't use you. Touch your neighbor. Say, you can make it. You can make it. But you got to have that inner circle of people who are going to remind you of your responsibility, your accountability, and your reliability, and most of all, your availability. You got to go further than you've been before. You got to get stronger than you've been before. Last part of the scripture helps us clearly here. We're talking about collaboration tonight. Once again, to my friends and family, we post this for me. Seven Foundations of Effective Christian. We are in part four. Part four. We're talking about collaboration tonight. And if you will add these points. For collaboration, we must be generous. We must be givers. Because you can be generous and still not be a giver. Y'all want me to teach that for a second? You can be generous enough to give all your time to the world and not be a giver unto God. I dare say this. You can be generous enough to give all your time to the church and not be a giver in your own home. Ooh. Not be a giver in your own marriage. Not be a giver to your own children. But you're generous everywhere else to include the house of God. Your faith, your first ministry is within your household. What good is it to learn all you learn from the house of God and not practice it in your own household? So our first point talks about we must be generous. Our second part talks about we must be givers. Our last part tells us because he says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity, we must be godly. We have to have the spirit of God in collaborating. Some people say, well, it's economically sound for us to come together. Okay, economically sounds correct, but is it godly? Is it godly? Some might say, well, it works for us because we both uh, are able to uh, take care of the kids better if we come together. But is it godly? Well, it, it, we can come together because it helps him because he need, you know, somebody to help clean up or somebody to, you know, help him get to the doctor and she need me to be able to do this. Is it godly? Because when it's godly, it's good and it's pleasant. But I also got to tell you, you got to be prepared to have some pleasantry in your misery. Because he's there the whole time. And so, my brothers and sisters tonight, let's look and we'll see what God would have us to say. We talked about tonight collaboration. Amen. We talked about being generous. We talked about being givers. We talked about being godly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, you know what we needed to hear tonight, God. You know what we needed to put into place and put into practice, God. We ask right now that you could just take us to the new level, Lord. Show us that you love us and that you're with us, God. We ask right now that you would cover each and every one of us. We ask that, God, we 
If there's anyone tonight, God, has not heard your word, tonight they heard it and they want to reunite with you, God. They want to be under your will. They want to confess and believe that you died for their sins and so they want to be saved. I ask right now you would receive them, Lord. Lord, I ask tonight if there's anyone who doesn't have a church home, God, they need a place of accountability, responsibility, and reliability by making themselves in the spirit of availability that you would convict them to reach out and find that place to call their own. We thank you, God, for those who are sick. We ask that you would heal them. For those that are lost, we ask you would find them. So in the grace of our God, the love of Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, may it rest and about henceforth now and forevermore. And we all say together, amen, amen, amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters, tonight. I pray that you will come and visit with us Sunday mornings at 1130 a.m. Mount Zion Tabernacle Christian Church, located at 2986 Silver Star Road, just about an eighth of a mile west of the Frito-Lay Warehouse. We let you to come by and see us. Mount Zion Tabernacle Christian Church. Well, all you need is a touch from him. God bless you. God keep you. Mount Zion, I love you. First Lady Murray, bye-bye.